Good morning. Uh, we have come now to one of the highlights of the Vasco annual meeting. Uh, I hope all of you have recovered from last night's party. Um, every medical student is taught to look for Holman sign to diagnose a DVT of the lower extremity. Dr. John Holmans, a professor of surgery at the Brigham and Yale, also popularized the ligation of the saphenofemoral junction to treat varicose veins, advocated venous ligation to prevent pulmonary emboli, and described the first DVT associated with a long plane ride. His contributions go well beyond vascular surgery to include work with Cushing and Gross on the pituitary gland. He was one of the founders of our society and a lecture in his honor was established during the fourth vascular annual meeting of the society. It has only been delivered 12 times by some of our most distinguished surgeons. Our Holman's lecturer today is Dr. Jack Cronenwet. His contributions to vascular surgery are too many to count. To list a few, he led the division at Dartmouth and its training program to its current prominence. He embraced the integrated program when few others would. He led many societies and will be remembered for helping engineer the merger of the SVS with the AAVS to form today's Society of Vascular Surgery. His crowning achievement, however, is the Vascular Quality Initiative. His drive for quality improvement started with the Vascular Study Group of New England. His persistence, commitment, and vision made our current nationwide VQI structure a reality with over 560 participating centers, providing the backbone of data to inform our decisions and improve quality care to our patients. If anyone is still wondering, why should I join the Vascular Quality Initiative? You will have your answer shortly. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our Holman's lecturer for this year, Dr. Jack Cronenwent. Thank you very much, Mac. Uh, it's, it's a singular honor to be asked to give this lecture. Uh, and when I reviewed the names uh, of the previous members who have given this lecture, uh, it's certainly never been more true than we stand on the shoulders of giants. And uh, the Vasker Quality Initiative, uh, for me, had its beginnings uh, with another giant. Uh, when uh, Norm Hertzer, in 1994, gave his presidential address, and stressed, uh, based on his experience with uh, registries in Ohio, that uh, outcome assessment is really everything that we needed to keep track of our results. Around the same time, I, I was fortunate to be living in New England where some cardiac surgeons had become concerned about publication of their mortality rates in the New York Times, <laughs> and they started to uh, look to each other for help. And in New England, uh, in a few centers, when they compared their outcomes, they realized that there was quite a variation in mortality. So they decided to form a regional collaborative group to share data, to, to use a registry to understand their differences in practice and variation, to, to meet twice a year, to talk about the data, to discuss it, to learn from each other. And uh, at the end of uh, four or five years, they had reduced the mortality of cabbage by 24%, and all the hospitals showed improvement. Well, a few years later, uh, we looked at the variation in vascular care in the Dartmouth Atlas <coughs> and saw that there was a m major variation, regional variation, in both the rate of procedures and the outcome of procedures. And it was these three things that uh, influenced me to start thinking about how we can do better in vascular surgery. So on May 25, 2001, a small group of surgeons from nine hospitals in New England met to consider whether we should try to form a regional quality improvement group similar to what we had learned from our uh, cardiac surgery colleagues. 
and we discussed this and we're very clear on the mission. It was going to be focused on quality, improving quality, safety, effectiveness, and reducing cost. And we decided that we would learn from others and take the same route that the cardiac surgeons seem to be using successfully. So pick a few key procedures, at that time only three, that we would look at in detail, do anonymous reporting so we could compare ourselves with others, learn from that, use quality techniques, and meet twice a year to talk about our data. And importantly, different from the cardiac group, we decided that for many of our prophylactic procedures, uh, in-hospital outcome was not enough. We thought we needed one-year follow-up, and so we committed to getting that data when the patients came back to their office, and we formed the Vassar Study Group of Northern New England. So a lot of work happened over the next two years. We had seven meetings, in-person meetings, where we worked on the difficult problem of what to put in the form. Not too much data, not too little data. Details about the patient and the procedure that might be important for risk adjusting and, of course, the outcomes. We had a rule that you could only have one side of one piece of paper for a data form, and we, we scrimped a little bit on the font size uh, to get the data there. At the time, we were using paper forms with central data processing, and we were excited on January 1, 2003, we started collecting data from 12 hospitals. And so we had our first meeting later that year, and we had data on 500 patients. And um, of course, we didn't have any outcome data yet because we weren't even at a year. And so we thought, well, well, we'll look at something that we can look at, like the process. And we said, well, all of our patients are on a statin, we think. Let's look at statin use. Well, when we looked at it, we see only about half of our patients were on statin. These are the first 25 surgeons uh, in, the, in the VSGNNE. And uh, we were surprised, but we talked about it a lot, and we all thought we could do better, and we kept feeding back data to the surgeons, and within three years, we were up to 80%, and every single surgeon improved. And so the, the great learning around that was that if we gave feedback to competitive surgeons about how they compared with others, they would change their practice because everyone wanted to be the best. So from 2003 to 2007, we continued data collection, and by 2007, we were up to 8,600 cases. And we had achieved 86% one-year follow-up in this very dedicated group of people who started doing this. And we looked at the data, and we were going to publish it, but the outcomes looked really pretty good, and we were afraid people would think we were cherry-picking. So we did a claims-based audit to be sure that we were getting all the cases, and that's still in place today in VQI. So when we were convinced we had accurate data, we published our first paper in 2007, now four years later. It was presented at this <coughs> meeting in Baltimore that year. And after that, we started to get interest from a lot of other people. So uh, importantly, 2008, 2009, five centers from Massachusetts joined. We had to change our name to New England instead of Northern New England. And guests from other parts of the country started to come and attend these regional meetings to try to understand what was happening. More data provided more opportunity. So by 2010, we were up to 14,000 cases. And, and we had done a number of projects. We improved our medication use. We improved the rate of carotid patching. And we showed that it reduced restenosis. We created better, more uh, vascular specific risk prediction models for uh, cardiac outcomes. And then uh, David Stone did an important study because we realized in our region that about half the surgeons used protamine after a carotid endarterectomy and about half didn't. And they either always used it or they always didn't. It wasn't biased. And David showed that the reoperation for bleeding, a pretty hard endpoint, was reduced to a third. And when this was published and actually presented at this meeting, and immediately after that in VQ in the vascular study group, the protamine use rate went from the previous 46% up to 61%. And during the next two years, the reoperation for bleeding rate fell in half. So this was a, the perfect example of you use the registry to evaluate data for research. The publication of that research by people who trust the data changes their practice, and the practice change can improve outcomes. 
So the growth continued. Uh, and that required more infrastructure. We couldn't continue to use these paper forms. So in 2009, we partnered with a local Dartmouth spin-off company named M2S to create an electronic infrastructure. And as more larger hospitals were trying to join the initiative, more concerns arose around data privacy and confidentiality and protection from legal discovery. And so we created a patient safety organization to house this complete structure to, to uh, avoid the need for informed consent for quality purposes and to protect the data. And during those two years, 16 centers from outside New England, the first call I got was from Washington State, that we'd like to join the regional quality initiative. And that was great, and we created an adjunct member status so they could get a report. But the concept was, if you had a regional meeting, you'd have local ownership, and you'd have local trust, and you'd have good discussions, and you'd, you'd put a verb onto the whole sentence that would actually initiate quality improvement initiatives locally. So this created an opportunity, potentially, to have more regional quality improvement groups. Well, the SVS recognized this potential, so in 2011, the SVS took over this patient safety organization and launched the National Vascular Quality Initiatives. And that same year, uh, four you know, key regional leaders, Jeb Hallett, Adam Beck, Mike, Mark Davies, and Fred Weaver, started regional quality groups in different parts of the country to do the same thing we'd been doing in New England. Well, here we are today, and, and you've seen these graphs before. The growth since then has been uh, linear and now over 500 centers, 12 registries. We've expanded 18 quality groups, and all these groups meet twice a year, and they sit together and they discuss their results and they plan quality improvement. 3,400 physicians vary multi-specialty. So the mission has remained the same since it was when it started around quality improvement. And, and the reason that this has been sticky and the reason that hospitals and regions get value is that they receive these reports that, of data that they otherwise don't have access that gives them a comparison with others, which is tremendously stimulating for them to want to improve their processes and outcomes. They trust the data, they enter the data, they act on the data. And they get a lot of help in doing so. The, the SVS uh, PSO has created a great infrastructure for this to, in terms of its governance, quality councils, the regional group organization, and then at individual centers, the same processes are used. Analyze the data to look for variation because variation provides the opportunity for improvement, whether it be in process or an outcome leading to these quality initiatives. So there's a VQI annual meeting that was held on Wednesday with great participation. There's a very robust website that contains uh, information for, for how to do this. There's even a project guide that has you, allows you to walk step by step through a quality improvement initiative at your hospital. All these are available at vqi.org. One of the biggest uh, uh, factors that has implemented quality improvement have been these quality specific reports for each hospital that show them how they can improve. So a multivariable model is developed to understand the factors associated with an outcome. Each of these outcomes are put into a report and shown to the center in terms of how they compare with others. So this was a quality initiative around length of stay after EVAR. You can see the observed and expected rates. And within two years of, of producing this report, across all the centers in VQI, the EVAR length of stay was significantly reduced. And if you drill down on an individual level, you can see this particular hospital had a high length of stay. And if you look at where they were out of range, these red bars in the upper 25th percentile, they had a very high rate of complications. So they knew exactly why their length of stay was long. And in contrast, this hospital for stroke after carotid endarterectomy had a high stroke rate. And they had a very high rate of dysrhythmia and hypertension following these procedures which is where they were able to focus their improvement efforts. And there are many now examples 
at the national level, at the regional level, or the, even the local level of quality improvement projects, decreasing MIs, hematomas, transfusions, et cetera, as you see here, increasing smoking cessation, long-term follow-up. The mechanisms for these are that national quality initiatives are initiated by the quality councils. They're emphasized and discussed at all the regional, and, uh, regional group meetings. And then, importantly, feedback's provided to the centers to show them how they're doing. And at the local level, now for the VQI Participation Award includes quality improvement projects. And these can be submitted when they are then supported by the SVS PSO staff. The topics are aggregated into similar groups to have monthly conference calls to learn from each other, then to give feedback to the center, and then recognize these quality initiatives at the VQI annual meeting. Last year, there were 55 separate quality projects launched locally. And when you hear these presentations at the meeting by the people who are excited about this and see their progress, it's, it's unbelievably uh, rewarding. So I said we focus on variation. And so here's a couple snapshots of where we are today with variation across VQI among hospitals who are committed to quality. So this was 2017 to current data. And the first section over here says, um, oops, I guess I think I went one too far here. Um, how do we treat lower extremity disease? Do we treat it with bypass or with PVI? And this is the mean rate across all the procedures at each center. So what that means is you see claudication versus CLI. This center treats 100% of cases with intervention, and this center treats 100% of cases with bypass. That's what you call variation. And why, do we, why is there some differences? Well, maybe the thresholds are different. How do we select patients? So this is the mean ABI of claudicants who were treated at each center. So in these centers over here, they don't treat claudication. They treat claudication with an ABI of 0.8. These centers treat it only if it's 0.5. These centers are going to be doing a lot more cases. Again, that's a lot of variation. How about carotid treatment? How often do we treat asymptomatic patients versus symptomatic patients? Now, referral pattern is different, and I get that, but here's the carotid endarterectomy, carotid stenting. These centers, 80% of their patients are asymptomatic. These centers, only 10% are asymptomatic, and there's not that much difference between stenting and endarterectomy. Why might this be? Well, maybe we have different thresholds. So what is the, peak, the mean peak systolic velocity at which we treat an asymptomatic patient for carotid disease? Well, in these centers, it's upwards of 600 centimeters per second. In some centers, it's down around 100. That's significant variation. So the other thing we can do with VQI data, as you heard at the Crawford session, was to use it to, to inform our practice guidelines, but also to monitor the compliance in real time. We can see from day to day and month to month whether people are changing. So we have a lot of guidelines. Uh, don't operate on small aneurysms. Don't treat perforators in patients with only C2 disease. There's a couple. Well, we have some opportunity for improvement if we're going to follow these guidelines. You can see over here the rate at which small aneurysms are operated. Uh, and, and these centers, they, they don't treat any small aneurysms. And down here, half the aneurysms they treat are below the recommended thresholds. And for perforator treatment, most people don't treat perforators in C2 disease, but a few centers treat quite a few of those patients. More opportunity. So. Big, uh, big data, more data, allows more learning. So here is a study by Randy DiMartino that most of you have seen that showed that if you simply discharge your patient with arterial disease on an aspirin and a statin, that you significantly improve their five-year survival. And at the time this was published in 2015, here's the distribution of how often we achieve this across VQI centers. These variations charts are starting to look the same. Lots of opportunity for improvement. So this was recognized by the 
Quality Committee and they established a promotional campaign to show how many lives you could save by simply putting an automated order in your discharge proceeding and you can see how the rate of dissemination of this knowledge and establishing this quality improvement initiative has substantially increased and changed people's behavior. And in the future, when we can look at the five-year mortality, we expect it's going to be a lot lower, and that's pretty significant. The big data has led to increasing number of publications now, over 230 peer-reviewed publications from VQI data. I looked at the first 20 publications this year. Um, they were from more than 20 different institutions emphasizing collaborative data, and every paper had a unique first author. So not only is the work distributed, but the research is distributed, and that's what's allowed this to grow so rapidly. One of the uses of the big data in research has been to create risk prediction algorithms that are specific for vascular patients, and they can be accessed on this smartphone app. So get QXMD on your smartphone, and then you can enter the specific variables for your patients. You can even use this in the office. Our students use it in the conferences. And you can enter data about this patient who has an asymptomatic carotid, and it will show you that their predicted two-year survival is very high, and probably good for an operation, but throw in a little congestive heart failure and renal dysfunction, these two-year survivals less than 50 percent, they may not be the right patient to do a carotid if they're asymptomatic. Now, we've learned uh, that device evaluation is, is important because we use so many devices in vascular care and their outcome affects our treatment. And the VQI data has proved valuable to help uh, evaluate these devices. We know that after a device is evaluated in a pre-market trial, it's often used in different patients, different conditions. It's often used off-label, and we don't have good guidance. Both the FDA and the European Commission have emphasized the importance of registry-based real-world evidence to evaluate device, and now the VQI has been used for a number of device evaluation projects in collaboration with and in, in uh, agreement with FDA guidelines. Most recently, it's been used uh, to create objective performance goals for uh, lower extremity interventional treatment under the auspices of the FDA's uh, medical a device epidemiology network or MD EpiNet in the so-called RAPID project. And for that project, even though it's a multidisciplinary collaborative, only VQI had the data that were needed to work in the, to create the OPC because of our long-term follow-up. And Danny Birches uh, has put this together. It's in preparation. It's now OPGs based on over 20,000 procedures to look at the, the, appropriate, the expected outcome of atherectomy, stenting, and balloon angioplasty in SFA and popliteal disease. And if you still aren't convinced about the importance of this, you heard uh, Danny on Wednesday at this meeting present data about paclitaxel. Everyone uh, is aware of the data, the, the analysis that showed a potential mortality signal after two years. Uh, even the, the regulatory agencies have recommended consideration of alternate treatment. But we've collected this data now for the last several years in VQI, and Danny's uh, analysis looking at mortality at two years based on 4,000 patients, which is the same number as in these meta-analyses, showed no difference in survival at two years, and if the data are combined, a slight benefit for the paclitaxel patients. He'll present this at the FDA panel meeting next week, and it'll again emphasize the importance of the device data that we collect in VQI and how important that is for the safety of our patients. There have been a number of other collaborations that the VQI has been involved with. One is the coordinated registry network called Vision, which has been a work primarily of Phil Goodney and Art Sidrakian, where they have been able to link the detailed granular VQI registry data with Medicare claims data. And the benefit of that, of course, is to be able to look at longer term outcomes. So here are some examples of what we can do now in looking at the outcome of EVAR. So this is the late reintervention rate based on Medicare claims, which is shown to be 
quite accurate when it's been tested, looking at the difference between reintervention rate and ruptured symptomatic or elective patients. It's possible to compare different devices which are tracked in VQI, look at their reintervention rate over time, and now it's possible to begin to send reports back to centers to show not only did the patient survive your EVAR treatment, but how many times are you having to reintervene on those patients over a long period of time, well beyond the one-year follow-up that's normally available in VQI. Another important collaboration in this area has been the transcarotid artery revascularization project, a, a, a collaboration with CMS. Uh, although the device was approved, people believed that there needed to be more evidence to potentially differentiate transcarotid procedures from transfemoral procedures. So CMS agreed to reimburse the procedure in uh, both asymptomatic and symptomatic standard risk, pa high risk patients uh, if the centers agreed to collect evidence in VQI. So now more than 5,000 of these procedures have been done and recorded in VQI. The practice change, as you see in this bar graph, have changed significantly, and the initial data suggests, in fact, that the TCAR approach is going to be uh, as and likely more effective than the transfemoral approach. And this data has been very welcomed by CMS and will be used when they make their next national coverage decision around carotid stenting. There have also been important international collaborations. The International Consortium of Vascular Registries is based primarily on VQI and the, and the European Society's VASCUNET, 16 countries that are now meeting twice a year and sharing data from their individual registries to learn not only within our country but across the world what we can learn from differences in practice. And there are major differences in practice. This is the rate of uh, elective aneurysms that are treated by EVAR. Uh, in Hungary, where they have some socioeconomic issues, very few treatments by EVAR, and in the United States, 80%. Uh, how about treating asymptomatic carotides? In Italy and the U.S., very high frequency of asymptomatic pain. In Denmark, zero. They don't reimburse it, they don't treat it. And another interesting finding, small aneurysm treatment. Turns out, that if you have fee-for-service reimbursement, you're much likely, more likely, to operate on small aneurysms than if you have capitated reimbursement. So perhaps our decisions are influenced by things other than the patients. We can learn from this. The, the last topic, or next to the last, that I'm going to just touch on is that we've begun to use e, uh, VQI to reduce hospital costs, to understand and reduce costs, which we all recognize is important. And this was a study that was done two years ago, a pilot study across 18 centers in VQI to look at the cost of routine EVAR. So we were able to use the clinical data from VQI to filter these patients and know that we were comparing apples to apples across 18 centers. We did a project, did the project with Vizient to derive costs from charges and we showed a two-fold variation in cost of these procedures which was almost all due to differences in device and, and supply costs. And this allowed hospitals an opportunity to learn from each other. And Ron Dahlman last year presented data to show that Stanford, who participated in this, was able to take the data, do some underlying cost analysis, and significantly reduce their costs for this procedure going forward. Now the ideal thing would be, of course, to look at value, and that is to compare both quality and cost. So here's an example in those same 18 centers of using an adjusted major adverse event rate developed by Brian Nolan and comparing that with cost. And these are actual data, and here you'd like to be down here in the high quality, low cost center, and not up here in the low quality, high cost center. These are the types of information that can be derived from VQI that will greatly influence practice. And to further extend this, we've just launched a pilot project to begin to look, to drill down and be able to look at the detailed cost analysis system in each hospital, such as you see here, and create user interactive dashboards that again, take advantage of being able to sort patients, not just based on heterogeneous DRG categories, but rather on the detailed clinical data available in VQI 
so that we can understand that we're comparing the same patients, understand that detailed cost categories, even group this and compare by physicians, and ultimately, under the umbrella of the Patient Safety Organization, be able to compare our costs and our quality across different hospitals so that we can all learn from each other and make improvement. Monitoring physician import, uh, performance is increasingly uh, important uh, and being used. As you know, of course, Medicare has the MIP system that requires physicians to report outcomes. Now you even have to participate in some of the registries to get reimbursement for, for TAVR and TCAR, and I can tell you more of this is coming down the line from CMS. Payers need data to negotiate bundled or capitated payment. We need data to give them just being listed as a preferred provider, we're working now to try to eliminate prior authorization for physicians who meet certain requirements in VQI. And of course, certification, not only your American Board of Surgery, but as you've heard from Tony Sadawi on Thursday, the new SVS Vascular Center Verification Program. The important thing is that VQI can meet all of these needs for both physician providers and hospitals. So what about the future? Where are we going with all this? What's going to happen? Uh, sort of my crystal ball. Uh, registry data, I think, is going to become increasingly more important and powerful. The, um, we have a problem right now with the burden of dual data entry. That will be solved over the next 10 years as, uh, as structured data elements are captured in EMR systems at the point of care that can be directly transferred to the registry. And importantly, on the flip side of that, a direct linkage between the registries and the EMR systems will allow learning from the registry to be translated back to provide patient-specific and not just generalized guidelines at the point of care to help us remember to order that medication or, or do further evaluation before or even select the best treatment for the patients. I think everyone understands that payments are going to be more directly based on performance, performance measures. And again, VQI is ideally situated to play this role because it's multi-specialty, multi-stakeholder, and patient-focused. And so you might ask yourself the question, if you're not participating in VQI, who do you want to measure your performance? So if I return to the question that Mac posed, why should I join the Vascular Quality Initiative? I would join uh, because I anonymously want, I want to anonymously compare myself and my center with others. I want to improve. Uh, processes and outcomes. I want to select the best treatment for, for my patient. I want to reduce cost, select the best devices, and monitor their performance. Or perhaps I want to use the data and the reports because I want to perform research or develop or monitor practice guidelines. I want to obtain reimbursement for new procedures. I want to negotiate with payers. I want to maintain my board or get my new SVS Vascular Center certification. And most importantly, at the end of the day, I want to actively participate in quality improvement. I want to know my results. I want to make them better at my center, in my region, in my country, and internationally. So I'd like to close just by uh, acknowledging that the success of VQI is due to the distributed nature of it. The more than 200 members who volunteer on various committees in various regions to drive this effort, the dedication of the PSO staff, who all understand the old aphorism that if you want to go far, go together. Thank you.